We often view social progress as something that is inevitable. The moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. However, in the case of South Africa, while other countries were moving towards racial integration and acceptance, they moved backward. From 1910 to 1948, South Africa fought in two world wars, took over Namibia, weathered the Great Depression, and developed an economy based around its mining industry supporting white farmers and foreign investment. But more importantly for this story, they began a political transition that would cement a regime of white supremacy and racism. However, things didn't have to continue down this road. There were reform-minded Afrikaners who were appalled at the abuses against the Africans. But they were overwhelmed by the trends in Afrikaner society that moved it to adopt a system that it would call apartheid. What is an Afrikaner? You might just assume that they are Dutch people in Africa, but this is only a small part of the story. Just as English settlers in America developed an identity of their own through their experience living away from England, so too did the Dutch settlers develop an identity of themselves as part of the new land they lived in. And although they lived in a system of white supremacy, they were at this point in history half as wealthy as the English. You see, during this period of time, the country was ruled by the South African Party, later to be called the United Party, founded by Louis Botha and Jan Smuts. And though they were Afrikaner Republican guerrillas, they reconciled themselves to being a part of the British Empire and relied on the British electorate. But this didn't sit well with one James Barry Munich Herzig, who disliked these concessions and thus created his own party called the National Party in 1914, dedicated to the economic interests of the Afrikaners and Afrikaner nationalism. These people shuffled around in coalition after coalition, until in 1933 when the demands of the Great Depression brought them together with Herzog as the head of the government. But in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. South Africa was faced with a decision to join the British in the war. Herzog, at this time, was the Prime Minister and opted to remain neutral. However, the Parliament voted to enter at 80 to 67. He left the party and resigned as Prime Minister over this decision. Later, he would join the other right-wing Afrikaner nationalist parties, and although he would die shortly thereafter, this coalition would eventually win a fateful election in 1948. Any hope of reform was lost at this point, and a system that they called apartheid would be formed. They advocated for a system that ensured white access to African labor while restricting Africans to their reserves. From 1948 onwards, things would get worse. Apartheid functioned under four assumptions racial division, white supremacy, African subjugation, and African separation along ethnic lines. They created what they called homelands, or Bantu stands for the African populations to live in. First eight and later ten, they were called Transki, Bofutatswana, Venda, Siske, Labawa, Gazankulu, Kwakwa, Kwazulu, Kwanindebele, and Kwanegwane. For Africans to leave these homelands, they would require passes. They kept Africans separate from each other and whites, and it forced them closer into these homelands. In a cynical attempt to justify this system, they marketed it as a form of decolonization, even claiming that each of these Bantu stands were self-governing, and that the Africans living there were citizens of each respective Bantu stands. Africans living outside of the Bantu stands were slowly but surely pushed into them. In 1950, 39.7% of the African population lived in the Bantu stands. In 1980, it was 52.7%. However, the South African government wanted the Africans to become migrant laborers, able to be readily exploited by white farmers. So they created a pass system in which Africans required passes to leave their Bantu stands and work. But as South Africa began to urbanize, the African population that still remained in white-controlled South Africa began to congeal around townships and cities. They would form squatter camps outside of cities, such as the infamous Soweto, which was located on the outskirts of Johannesburg. However, the Africans did not accept this system and would resist white supremacy since the inception of South Africa. In 1912, the South African Native National Congress was created, which would later be called the African National Congress, or the ANC. This organization was dedicated to ending the discrimination of the Africans by rational argument and persuading the white electorate. This did not work, and they achieved basically nothing initially. More radical organizers formed the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. They saw the ANC as being led by good boys, 
who placated white liberals too much. They promised land repossession and national liberation. They also basically achieved nothing. These movements would soon fizzle out in the 30s. However, by the time World War II was underway, a new movement led by the youth, who were extremely frustrated by the older generation's failures, would emerge. The political context of the world had changed in 1941. The Atlantic Charter was published, which stressed the rights of people's self-determination. And drawing from this, the Youth League of the ANC would begin to organize. In 1943, Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, and Walter Sisulu would go on to found this Youth League and eventually become the leadership of the ANC. Something that should be highlighted about the ANC leadership is their education. They were mainly educated in the missionary schools established by the church throughout Southern Africa. These were highly educated members of the African middle class and often had occupations such as lawyer, clergy, or journalist. For Africans, this was virtually the only way to be educated at the time, and any movement with the ambition of the ANC did require talented leaders. This is notable due to the total dismemberment that the South African government would do to this valuable resource of African resistance. In 1953, the government took control of African education. The reason for this was simple. Native education should be controlled in such a way that it should be in accord with the policy of the state. If the native in South Africa today, in any kind of school in existence, is being taught to expect that he will live his adult life under a policy of equal rights, he is making a big mistake. There is no place for him in the European community above the level of a certain form of labor. This younger, educated generation would pick up where their elders left off. In 1949, Mandela, Sisulu, and Tambo became a part of the ANC leadership. In 1952, along with the South African Indian Congress, they began a passive resistance campaign involving disobedience of unjust laws that ended the next year due to riots and the severe tr crackdown on them by the parliament. Then, in 1955, the ANC, along with other organizations, convened a Congress of the People. This Congress included delegates mainly from African society, but made space for those in the Indian, colored, and white classes. They came together and created the Freedom Charter, which stated that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and that no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. The South African government labeled them communists, and then arrested 156 people with treason. Not everyone was happy with the approach of the ANC at this time and felt that they had conceded too much to the white interests in the Freedom Charter. Robert Subukwe, a Bantu language instructor, mobilized this sentiment to form the Breakaway Group of the Pan-Africanist Congress in 1959. In 1960, they launched a campaign of civil disobedience against the past laws. On March 21st, 1960, Africans gathered at a police station in Sharpeville near Johannesburg. They came there to defy the apartheid system using a similar tactic that Martin Luther King employed in America. The police opened fire on the crowd. 67 Africans died. Nine days later, people peacefully gathered outside of the white parliament in Cape Town. The leader of this march, a student named Philip Kosana, was told that if he told the protesters to go home, they would receive him. After the protesters left, he got arrested. What followed this massacre and this protest would be the banning of the ANC and the PAC and thousands of arrests and beatings. The ANC was forced underground, and it was after this that they decided to take up arms. The government had ignored every peaceful attempt to end apartheid, so the ANC formed the Nkontua Wisizwe, the Spear of the Nation, which carried out bombings on post offices and other infrastructure. Mandela, Sisulu, and other ANC members were captured and sent to Robben Island in 1964. During his trial, Mandela describes his decision to leave passive resistance for sabotage. We of the ANC had always stood for a non-racial democracy, and we shrank from any policy which might drive the races further apart than they already were. But the hard facts were that 50 years of non-violence had brought the African people nothing but more and more repressive legislation, and fewer and fewer rights. It would be unrealistic and wrong for African leaders to continue preaching nonviolence at a time when the government met our peaceful demands with force. The ANC began operations outside of the country. Tambo managed to not get arrested 
and in 1967 became the President General in Zambia, operating in exile. With this political leadership gone or imprisoned, at this point in history, it seemed impossible that apartheid would end. The government of South Africa was powerful, had many allies around the world, and was willing to brutally crush any form of resistance. However, apartheid's demise was inevitable, and slowly but surely, it was put into the casket and nails began being driven into its coffin. It's hard to point to any one thing that caused apartheid to end in South Africa. Just as with many events in history, it had multiple causes that were all happening slowly and simultaneously that eventually wore the government out until they decided to negotiate with Mandela. One could look to the broader changes across the continent that influenced this decision. One after another, African countries were gaining independence from the British, French, Belgians, and Spanish, so that by the 1970s, the only colonial regime that still existed near South Africa were the Portuguese colonies of Mozambique and Angola, along with another apartheid regime in Rhodesia. The Free African Nations, as a part of the UN, sponsored resolutions against the South Africans and condemned their occupation of Namibia. This resulted in even more pressure against the regime. In 1975, Mozambique and Angola gained independence from the Portuguese, and in 1980, the Rhodesian regime ended and became Zimbabwe. South Africa was officially alone on the continent. Another reason is that apartheid is genuinely a terrible system in terms of governing a country towards prosperity. Most successful governments see their people as a valuable resource that it must allow to flourish, but under apartheid, so much human potential was wasted. Administering all of the apartheid laws was exhausting for the government, inflation increased by 10% during the 70s, and the country had a shortage of skilled labor that was needed in order to run the country. The population was also drastically changing. From 21% to 16%, the white population was clearly declining due to immigration and African birth rates. By the 21st century, it was projected that they would be 10% of the population. This is not a tenable situation. As the country began to urbanize, different tribal groups began living together in cities. They developed a common identity as Africans, which the government sought to suppress by keeping them separate, which more or less failed. African resistance against the government was still strong, even after the imprisonment of the ANC. Africans resisted through armed resistance and sabotage, which especially picked up in the late 80s. But also, they resisted through protests launched by the Soweto Uprising. As stated, the government sought to control the education of the African population and insisted half of their subjects be taught in Afrikaans. One student named Steve Biko decided that this was dumb and decided to create his own student organization called the South African Student Organization, or the SASO. The idea was that Africans should be taught without being dependent on white people and in ways that emphasize their own dignity. These ideals called the Black Consciousness spread throughout the country, and in 1976 spurred a protest in Soweto. When the police killed a 13-year-old boy, the protest became nationwide. By the next year, 575 people had been killed, 134 of them being children. The government decided to arrest Steve Biko, and during the arrest, the police beat him up so badly that he died from brain damage. This spurred the youth to join the ANC guerrillas in Angola and Tanzania. It spurred the UN to unanimously approve an arms embargo on South Africa. Protest movements around the world pressured their governments to use sanctions on South Africa. South Africa was losing all of its friends. Still though, South Africa had a powerful army. Their army invaded neighboring countries in raids, occupied Namibia, invaded Angola during its civil war, and supported armed groups in Mozambique. From 1980 to 89, they caused the deaths of 1 million and the displacement of 3 million. But this military strength soon would also be challenged. In 1988, in the Battle of Quito Cornerval, the South African forces suffered major losses against Cuba in the Angolan civil war. In return for a Cuban withdrawal from Angola, they agreed to end their occupation of Namibia in 1990. They weren't even the most powerful army in Africa anymore. At this point, negotiations were necessary for the country to exist. The political transition from apartheid to democracy was a very complicated tightrope that unfortunately is beyond the scope of this video. However, the person who walked this tightrope, Nelson Mandela, 
was still in prison before 1990. Why was he released? Well, to put it bluntly, the white government was screwed. For all the reasons laid out, they reached out to negotiate with Mandela under P.W. Botha. First, they cozied up to Mandela and sent him to a better prison in 1985. They told him that if he abstained from politics, that if he became a moderate, and that if he renounced armed struggle, he would be set free. The man who had been in jail for decades refused. Instead, Mandela offered his own deal. Legalize the ANC, free political prisoners, remove the military from the townships, and end the state of emergency. Begin negotiations toward majority rule. Botha wouldn't negotiate, though. But luckily for history, he had a stroke and was replaced by F.W. de Klerk. De Klerk was pretty much a wet noodle compared to the sheer force of will and intellect that was Nelson Mandela, and he legalized the ANC, the PAC, and the South African Communist Party. On the 11th of February 1990, Mandela was freed. This video covered the history of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa from 1910 to 1990, the period from 1990 to 1994, which covers a transitional period between apartheid to democracy, is its own story that deserves its own video, should it be covered by me or someone else. I would like to thank the wonderful uh, Pax Lark. He contributed art pieces that help speed up the process of making this video. Uh, here are some on the screen right now. You can find his channel in the description and go have a look. Uh, I really recommend it. Thanks, buddy.